Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Stoveside Chats. Uh, my name is Chad Blackwelder. Um, I work for the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. I do food service marketing. Um, thank you guys for being here today. Uh, today on the interview, we have um, Tommy Wheeler from uh, Tidewater Grain Company out of Oriental, North Carolina, um, and they're growing Carolina Gold Rice. Um, I'm pretty sure it's the first Carolina Gold Rice to be grown in North Carolina for a long time, um, but he's going to tell us more about that. As soon as I see him, uh, see his handle, I'm going to click on him. I'm just going to wave to some folks here. Um, hey, Bud Sauce, Down East, Mariculture, Culinary Adams, thank you guys for joining us. Appreciate it. All right, there's Tommy. Says we're waiting for Tidewater. Here he comes. Hey, Tommy. How's it going, Chad? You got me? Um, yeah, man. Looking good. Sounding good. Are you, uh, are you out on the farm today? I am not, uh, sadly. I, I had to come back to the big city for a little bit, but uh, we'll be heading back there here in a few days. I hear you. So, uh, everybody joining in, thank you very much for being here. This is Tommy Wheeler of Tidewater Grain Company. Um, the farm is in Oriental. Um, I know Tommy splits his time between the Charlotte area and then the eastern part of the state. Um, Tommy, tell us a little bit about yourself, some of your background, and, and how you wound up in the rice game. Boy, that's a, that's a good way to put it, the rice game. You know, it's uh, a, a lot of times Al Sproul and I, who oh, co-own Tidewater Grain, we stand around at the mess we're in, cover from head to toe in mud or a uh, broke down tractor or upside down in a canal trying to fix a pump and and we look each other at each other and laugh and say man all this to kill a duck that's kind of our refrain uh that you know we we really ended up where we're at today all uh due to duck hunting to be honest with you that uh, it all started off with a, a bunch of really close friends that grew up together some I've known since I was in preschool and uh, lifelong best friends that are still right alongside me and it started off really as a, a rekindled passion for the Oriental area and duck hunting down there that then logically led to, well, we need more duck hunting property. We need more recreation. This is fun. Let's do more. Let's do more. Let's do more. That ultimately ended up in uh, a farming enterprise that then grew to more and more and more uh, mm -hmm. and a partnership with Alston Sproul Farms that is a fifth generation farming entity. And Al's one of my best friends in the whole world. And it became a a natural slide as we were looking to grow uh, our recreational opportunities and our business opportunities to, uh, to to migrate to rice like they do in the the Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana area for a waterfowl habitat. That and the culmination of uh, this hyper regional focus uh, towards all things historic Eastern North Carolina. Uh, the more you read, the more you learned about that culture. The more you learned about the colonization and the, and the grains and the small grains that were around in the pre-colonization time frame, this concept of rice, rice, rice keeps coming up. And uh, and in the duck hunting universe, rice, 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 or corn, corn, corn. And so it made a, a natural symbiotic relationship that uh, has led us to this mess we're in now, this beautiful mess we have today. Well, your, your story, I guess, kind of reflects uh, how Carolina gold rice kind of got started again back in the – the 80s, uh, Dr. Richard Schultz, who was a big duck hunter down in South Carolina, wanted to do what you're doing, uh, maintain some of those wetlands and have a better habitat for to, for ducks to come congregate and make for better hunting. And then it kind of took off from there. Um, but now you guys are the first to do it in North Carolina in how long now? So this is uh, like my, my big claim to fame here is that we are the undisputed best Carolina gold rice farm in North Carolina. Right. I, that is something I feel comfortable claiming at this point, uh, because we're the only commercial enterprise that's, uh, that's in North Carolina, uh, which has proved to be problematic, of course, from a marketing and uh, some of the infrastructure required. Uh, but, you know, for the last 120 years, this crop was effectively lost around 1900, 1910, uh, when you had a really a, a culmination of a lot of uh, socioeconomic factors. You know, it was the, the post-Civil War era and 
and you know the South trying to figure out how they were going to uh, uh, thrive now that their entire um, world had been changed. Right, everybody was was trying to figure that out. You had the Industrial Revolution that was on us, uh, and so suddenly the thought of draining these marginal crop lands. Uh, that was never thought possible. So now suddenly you could grow corn, you could grow soybeans, you could grow cotton, you could do some things that you couldn't have done. And then, uh, you know, in eastern North Carolina, you can't talk about it without talking about hurricanes. And uh, you had a couple untimely hurricanes, and uh, and that really was the demise. Oh, excuse me, I about lost you there. Uh, that was really the demise of uh, Carolina gold farming. Up until, like you said, Dr. Schultz brought it back. And, uh, you know, the Carolina gold story has been a has been a story of just happy coincidence all the way from its origin back in 1685 when we wouldn't even have Carolina gold rice if it wasn't for a a merchant ship coming from Madagascar that had trouble. Right. It had trouble. And and someone saw that as an opportunity and turned that that uh, that problem into a happy coincidence. That's that's kind of led us to today. Yeah, absolutely. And um Kind of to, to add to what you were just talking about, you know, you were talking about kind of the demise of, of the grain at one point after the Industrial Revolution and then, um, you know, the Depression after that. And then uh, modern convenient products came out. Uncle Ben's ruled the market for a long, long time. And that's what a lot of people, that's what I grew up eating, you know, a lot. Um, but uh, it's cool what you guys are doing. And um, I know a lot of chefs are really excited about um, having this great ingredient that's very very coveted um there it is okay. um so now you guys were in our the flavors the flavors of north carolina show that the department of ag does every year um might be virtually this year we're kind of dipping our toe into that water right now but um, right. it's it's a, it was a funny story when you guys got set up i think that was your very first trade show as tidewater grain company and you guys got so much attention at the show from the buyers and from the chefs and end users who were there. By the end of the day, you had already kind of rethought your plans for growth. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Uh, the, the flavor show wrecked us. I mean, that's the only way to really uh, accurately describe it. You know, uh, Al and I set ourselves a real modest goal when we went in there, which was if we could find one group that would buy our rice, we would call it a success. Right. This was really our first foray into marketing um, this product. We, we loved it, but we're biased. Right. We, we thought it had a lot of potential. We thought the story was great. We thought everything it meant for our region and our, you know, the Oriental and Hortonsville community was great. Um, but we just weren't sure if that actually was going to equal a business. Um, so, you know, we went in there with that modest goal of, hey, if we can find one group that wants us, man, this will be great. And. It, it, like you said, we were uh, overwhelmed with uh, with all the, the different type things that got thrown at us between distribution and direct point of sale and, uh, you know, farmers markets and um, media uh, that were interested in writing and documenting our story. And how do we manage that? You know, it really uh, probably the smartest thing we did was after that, we stopped and said, let's just hit the brakes on everything and let's really think about who we are and who we want to be and make sure that all the partners that uh, that we move forward with match our culture and where we're wanting to go because the last thing we wanted to do was look in the rearview mirror and say wow that was the turning point where uh we made decisions that led us down a path we weren't happy with so far we've yeah. been it's been great you know it's been really an, an incredible deal i mean you think about this last amazing year we've had we've had a uh, the flavor show, which the, the response was overwhelming. You know, we were invited to be in the cooking for a classic show. I mean, which was, you know, a food contest to be a featured uh, ingredient. And that was uh, never thought of. Right. And and it's open doors that, that frankly, we would have uh, never been able to open. I mean, we are absolutely a testimonial for got to be NC Agriculture and the flavor show as to what it can do for an upstart business like us. Awesome. Well, yeah. Um, shout out to Sherry Barefoot, who's on our team. She's the uh, in charge of the specialty foods um, part of our marketing um, arm, and she does a great job with that show. Um, and also, now you've hooked up with Chef Keith Rhodes in the Wilmington area, and um, okay. once things start to open up, I think you guys are going to do some really cool stuff together. Yeah, one bad chef. I mean, who's got a cooler handle than that, right? 
He's a bad chef. <laughs> He's a bad chef. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, we've been fortunate enough uh, to, to make a connection there. And, uh, you know, our stories, I think, are just uh, – just just made 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 for tv you know what i mean it's going to be a great relationship and uh we you know that's the story we've got with a number of people we've been with some really unlikely uh partners you know i don't call them customers i call them partners because you know um it's, it's just been really interesting you know you take a group like uh, aaron bradley and the fresh list group right without without them i don't know where we would be uh, to be honest with you, because she challenged us to think bigger than we were when all this COVID stuff broke out. You know, we were, you know, so think about the swings we've been on uh, this year. You know, we went to the flavor show and, and everybody wanted us and every chef in town wanted us and all the distributors wanted us. And that was great. And we got all this product. We're getting ready to ship it. And then the whole world stops. And, uh, and you know, we were uh, selling things to uh, to the Fresh List group, thinking of them more as a smaller type suitor. Um, and she's, she started asking questions that pushed us, you know, can you do smaller packaging? Can you go away from your bulk distribution like you're doing for the restaurants? Can you do, you know, one cup type sizes that we're going to do mail order food? And we were looking into that market and had dipped our toe into it, but never really had gotten thrown into it like uh like the COVID stuff had and like that Aaron challenged us to be and uh we went from thinking wow you know it's going to be Q3 Q4 before this restaurant stuff opens back up and we sell our product um to being sold out before May we were completely out of product and only due to the pivot that we had made away from bulk distribution down to uh CSA type uh packaging and and direct point of sale for uh for the retailers and for the the home delivery model. Yeah. Now did, did being a, a new company kind of help you to be able to, to pivot pretty quick on your feet like that? I, I, Not I think so. I, absolutely. I absolutely think so because we didn't fall victim to the success of yesterday. We didn't have any success. We didn't have a, we couldn't look at each other and say, well, that's not how we do it here. You know, we, right. we make these package sizes and that's what the restaurants are like. And we make these and this is what the retail likes. We didn't have any of that data. We, we, we still don't know what uh, what you guys actually want. Um, but what I can say is that we're flexible enough and nimble enough that we can provide whatever that is. And that's yeah. the one thing that I know for sure now, you know, that we we ended up putting a packaging line online in-house because that became obvious that we weren't going to be able to outsource that to be as fleet of foot as we needed to be to depend on other people. And we doubled down on capital investment to uh, to make sure we were ready to, live up to that yeah well you guys are um you know you're asking the right questions i appreciate the the times that you reach out to me where we can we always yeah. have good conversations about your product and um with my background coming from the, the the chef world like and you know you wanting to reach out to those folks i hope i can answer your questions about what chefs are looking right. for you have great ideas about you know what's going to be easy to store to to ship that sort of thing so um, you know, you guys are coming up with some really cool ideas that are um, based off of what your market really, really needs. And, and again, man, this is such a great product because you have such a great story behind it. And as you know, the story sells the product 99% of the time. So you guys right. have a great story to tell. Sure. We do. And, uh, you know, that's, it's, uh, it's been fun. You know, every day is, is different. That's for sure. We've certainly had a, a fair share of challenges, right, being an upstart trying to start with all the usual startup type problems that you have and two named storms later, you know, we've had levy breaches and it's drove Al nuts trying to help me keep up with the, the levees to keep water in the rice fields. I feel like we've largely conquered that and heck our latest challenge is daggum crawfish are killing us. So if anybody knows anything about catching and killing crawfish, reach out to me. I need all the help I can get. They're aggravating okay. the snot out of us. Wow. Now, um, how many more how many more rice fields did you guys add um, just based off of the amount of growth or the amount of success you had in, in your first year? I think it's easier to think of it in multiples. Uh, you know, we're three more rice, four more rice fields, patties this year than we were last year, but it represents a 10x increase in flooded acreage. Uh, so, you know, obviously we have we have gone. We haven't bet the farm, but we've sure bet a house at this point. You know what I mean? Yeah. We've gone almost all in on it. 
uh, to try to uh, live up to our end of the deal. When people when people say, "Hey, can you can you satisfy me?" A guy like Keith Rhodes says, "Hey, I want this on my menu and I want it year round." You know, that's a partnership. That's a commitment. You got to make sure you got the product to make that a reality. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hello to Jamie Turner, who just waved at us, Chef Jamie Turner out of Charlotte. Um, so, yeah, so for those who aren't really that familiar with Carolina Gold Rice, tell us a little bit about it, Tommy. Well, Carolina Gold Rice, you know, is the it is called the granddaddy of uh, of rice in the Americas. You know, it, it came here like I alluded to earlier from re largely revered, you know, 1685 uh, when. Um, it was effectively discovered off the coast of South Carolina when a ship needed repairs. And a, an, an enterprising man by the name of Dr. Henry Woodward saw it as an opportunity and basically horse traded ship repairs for barrels of rice. Um, because at that point, you know, the, the small grains that were in the Americas were, it was almost a monoculture. You know, we just didn't have that many variety of small grains existing. And, uh, and it really flourished from there. You know, for rice to, to flourish, it needs to be mucky, soils abandoned soils low soils poor drainage you know that is that is built for what we, what we call the tidewater area you know from largely represents anything east of i-95 from uh georgia all the way to basically the uh norfolk area of virginia and uh you know it it's it's not been modified i think that's the most important thing you know all the rice that you buy at the big box stores or uh um your Uncle Ben's or anything that's commercially available at the grocery store has been modified, uh, frankly, with the with the simple credo of improving bottom line. Mm. And, uh, you know, the, the Carolina Gold variety um, is difficult to grow. It's tall. You know, the new varieties are short. They're easy to harvest. Their yields are higher. Um, you know, they, they, they strip the starch contents out of them. You know, they're, they're really pretty, right? And the reality is the original stuff is not pretty, typically, right? And Carolina gold is that, is that way. It's not a pretty easy crop to grow. Um, it fights you. It fights you all the way until we uh, put it in the grain bin um, because of those factors. And, well, it's like tomatoes. The, the best tomatoes are the ugliest tomatoes, those big cracked, big-shouldered heirloom tomatoes. And uh, right. Carolina Gold Rice um, is a short-grain rice. Uh, it works great for risotto. Um, it would be great for paella, for rice pudding. That's right. It's really, really starchy. Um, it can be a little tricky to cook. Yeah, it can be a little tricky to cook, you know. Um, and, and having a bunch of non-chefs like us try to figure it out has, has been a challenge all its own. Uh, you know, it, it can – if. If you're not careful, you can turn it into sticky rice really, really quick. Yeah. Um, especially yeah. if you have low patience like I do and try to stir it and mess with it too much, you know. Um, yeah. But if cooked correctly, it's it's incredible. We've done it on everything from sushi to uh, – I tell you, it's incredible as a red beans and rice dish. That's our latest low country thing down in eastern North Carolina. We have access to fresh, never frozen – seafood right you know scallops and shrimp and all that and we do a cajun a cajun dish that uh, that we have dubbed the uh, you know the the hortonsville gumbo basically and it's uh it's incredible where it's a red beans and rice and cajun shrimp dish so any of you chefs out there you better foot notice if you use that that's right that's right so tommy thank you for being here man um i really appreciate your time today and uh you guys uh Google Tidewater Grain Company, um, check out their website um, and get in touch with them. I know that you guys are getting ready for the next season. I know you're pretty much out of product right now, but you're getting geared yep. up for the next we're, program. We're at the vulnerable point right now where uh, we're about to harvest here. Hopefully, heading is just now beginning, and uh, we're hoping to have crop out of the field here the first part of August and then uh, product back on the shelf uh, by the middle to end of September. Okay. Heck, we've even got a beer coming out through Cabarrus Brewery that releases on August 14th called Carolina Gold Lager that's hitting awesome. the shelves. And uh, so go check that out as well. Kind of a co-branded product. It's been a fun collaboration uh, with those guys. That's really, really cool, man. That's great to hear. So yep. make sure you guys check out that beer as well. And, Tommy, thank you for being here today, and I will talk to you soon, man. Take care. Thanks, Chad. Awesome. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
All right. That was Tommy Wheeler from Tidewater Grain Company. You guys make sure you check out their website. Check out that new beer he was talking about. Um, lots of cool stuff coming up. Um, got a great interview next week. Chef Ashley Bibbins-Boyd, chef and owner of 300 East in Charlotte. All right. You guys have a great week. Thank you.